Hey everyone out there, wherever you are in the world listening today, welcome to the Cheap Mama Life. Thank you for joining us. The Cheap Mama Life offers a space for growth for you, for me, and for all of those who come and share their hearts with us on the show. Your Cheap Mama wants you to live your best life and she wants you to do so completely and totally free. She wants you to live a life of abundance, health, joy, and everything you've ever dreamt of. And she wants you to do so by applying smart financial principles and living within your means. Welcome to the Cheap Mama Life. Hi, and welcome to the show. This is Brenda Kilhoffer, and I am your Cheap Mama. And I always say I'm not cheap or easy, and to check with my husband, but my kids said that's really cheesy. So today I'm just going to leave it at it's cheesy. (laughs) Anyway, um, I have a really special guest who I became really fast friends with today. Her name is Brie Fallot. She is a brand strategist for Instagram. And I can't tell you how many amazing deep conversations that Brie and I have had. So I knew from the beginning as we became friends that I wanted to have her as a guest here on the podcast because she has so much wisdom. She's done everything from nannying to um, some spiritual counseling. She's got an opinion on everything. Uh, And you know what? The two of us, I think are going to have a great time today and hopefully um, give the listeners a lot to think about. And uh, so our topic today is going to be on health and wealth. Um, from a Christian perspective. So Bree, why don't I turn it over to you and have you introduce yourself? Hi, Brenda. Thanks for having me on. And yes, we've had lots of hours of conversation on the phone where I'm like, as soon as I met you, I'm like, I'm talking to my girlfriend. This is fun. I don't even know her. I've never met her in person. Yeah. So I am Bree Fallo. Um, By trade, I'm a brand and visualization strategist for Instagram. Um, I'm also a Christian, a daughter, a sister, um, someone that just wants people to get after it and live their best life on their terms. That's awesome. me. In that show. <laughs> and, and Brie is every bit of that and so much more. We've had so many incredible conversations on everything from marriage to, um, you know, to, to parenting because she'd spent so many years as a nanny and why don't, why don't we start there? Kind of tell it, tell the audience about your experience and how you kind of fell into um, almost a counseling um, perspective and what you maybe saw in relationships. And then we can kind of turn to how do we, you know, helping our audience um, be better moms, better wives, better to themselves and more loving to themselves and, and better friends. Right, right. So I have always been one um, that was like named the helper. I was a middle child. So my mom always turned to me and she's like, oh, Bree's my little helper, right? I was help with the household. And so the opportunity to babysit started when I was around like 11 as a mommy helper. I jumped at it. Uh, flashing to the end of my high school career, I'd worked with about 40 families in my community. And it was such an education because my parents are Pentecostal. They've been married for 38 years. And so we only know what we know from our background. And so that's what I thought family was. But when I nanny for these families from different religions and, and faith, spiritualities, different um, genders, obviously worked with several, you know, same sex couples to uh, folks that were divorced and blended families. I saw that there has been a huge shift when it comes to the American family. I, I saw something, my dad um, sent it over to me via email that, I think 65% of American children will experience some sort of divorce or or have to acknowledge divorce by the age of seven. So imagine me, a young girl in these situations where, you know, the parents are not talking and I have to take one baby from one car to another, right? Because that's the court arrangement. So um, I started to to see that there there was a lack of commitment and some of these relationships, but also um, a lack of identity. And when I would talk to these moms, because you become very, very close with the moms you're nannying with, I would ask them, like, did you see these warning signs? Um, was he manipulative? Or even to the guys, like, did did she come out of the woodwork as the friendly girl next door and she turned into the wicked witch of the West? What happened? And, and majority of the time, um, 
my clients would tell me, you know what, the signs were there, but I didn't know myself. I didn't know what I wanted. I never had that conversation about relationship, not even with somebody else, but with myself first, you know, loving yourself. The the term that people coined today is self-care, right? Which to me means pausing, reflecting, maybe journaling and, and checking in with yourself and seeing what you truly want. That's where, um, the health, wealth, and divine kind of comes in when it comes to my mindset is what does Brie want right now? What does Brie's heart desire? Um, But also what does the Lord desire for me as well? I think that's a key question. I think, especially for women to say, what is it that we want and what do we desire? I feel like from the time we're very, very young, um, we are, we come face to face with princess story after princess story after princess story we get into our teens and we're given you know these teen romance novels right. and and you brought up the girl next door it's always that girl next door and what happens she meets prince charming right. and you know maybe yeah, there's some kids. Yeah, maybe there's some 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 little struggle but they overcome it and then it's happily ever after And then fast forward into adulthood, we are still looking for that Prince Charming. Um, We're not necessarily, we've never really evaluated what do we want our lives to look like? What, you know, do we, do we want to be a mom? Um, Do we want to be a stay at home mom? You know, do we want, um, do we want a husband that's a professional that works? Do we want entrepreneurship? You know? we, we instead have this picture, uh, this picture, perfect view of Prince Charming. And when we start dating, it always feels fresh and romantic and exciting, just like the storybooks say. And nobody ever says, Hey, this takes work. This takes effort. Um, this takes a long-term commitment with both of you being willing to, to work on it. Nobody tells us that we, you know, we're walking into relationship with our own baggage that, that we're going to direct towards the other person. And I think, um, I think, I think you make a valid point that the first thing we need to do is decide what it is that we want, um, and recognize that, you know, it's, it's funny. We started on marriage. Today's my husband and mine's 18th wedding anniversary. Oh, congratulations. I love yeah. it. <laughs> and I reflected on how, you know, we've worked for this and that's right. what marriage is. Marriage takes two human beings who are absolutely willing to work through the, the different things that come about. So what, what kinds of pitfalls did you often see? Um, you know, that, that kind of brought you to this, this place of, Hey, you know, let's, let's start with, you know, what we want. Right. Well, I can only like reflect on, I'll start off with like myself is, you know, again, raised in the suburbs of Oregon, you know, um, I've always said that, you know, a hardship for my childhood was drinking tap water, right? Like I had both parents, I had uncle and aunt present, grandma and grandpa that were supportive, college fund. So I just felt like, okay, the Christian experience for me is to, you know, okay, God's going to provide a husband by 21. Okay, that works. And I'll have to have some kids and have um, a suburban home, right? Because that's what I knew. But it wasn't until nannying and then being able to, you know, be an international nanny um, a little bit further into my career and travel the world and see how the Parisian moms do things, see how the single moms do things, right? I, my, my experience broadened. Um, and that's when I realized that, you know what, I, I had a lot of ideas of what marriage was and what it was going to look like for me that just didn't pan out the way that I thought it was. And, and um, part of my story is I dropped out of college at 19 and I traveled the world. I've been to 60 countries and that really opened up a desire to travel. I mean, I got nicknamed a wanderlust, right? Just always jumping on a plane and going. But with that, I started to think, hmm, is my lifestyle that I'm building my career I'm building is that suitable for children because I do believe that you know when it comes to family life kids need structure whatever that structure is with for your family kids do need to go to bed at a certain time they do need to have a balanced diet they do need to be in the school or homeschooled or whatever There, there needs to be that structure so could I provide that and so there was 
definitely um, an evolution that had to to take place in my own self. And I, I saw that with a lot of the moms that I nanny for is that they weren't given the time to really ask themselves what they wanted. They met a guy or they were pushed into meeting a person and people were peer pressuring them. You know, your clock is ticking. Don't you want to have kids? Don't you want to go to college? Don't you want to be in the suburbs? Whatever the, the should of you should do this or you should do that. Um, so I feel very blessed to be able to have the opportunity just to sit still. And I feel like that's part of my calling is just like to ask women, what do you want? And make available the options that they may have because motherhood is not for everyone. But I think that if you do choose motherhood, you need to be all in and you need to put your kids first and there needs to be that, that structure. If you're going to be a mom, be a good one. Love your kids, <laughs> you know, love your husband, have your husband love you. Right. Absolutely. I know it's, um, motherhood isn't exactly the, what, what we grow up thinking either. I mean, we watch all these sitcoms and again, it's the perfect little family. And I, I love that you said I should have, I have a mentor that always says, you know, don't should all over yourself. It gets kind of messy. And I think so often we are looking for external affirmation, um, the external label of, oh, you're a good mom or super mom. I mean, I can remember volunteering a ton in the church and saying yes to everything and feeling Mm -hmm. so insanely and incredibly out of balance. Right. Um, And I was doing everything. I appeared to others as though I was completely involved in my kid's life. And the reality was I was involved in the things um, like boards, board meetings. And, right. um, d- but that didn't, I didn't get to spend time with them. I was their bus driver. I wasn't right. there. <laughs> I, I wasn't the person that was sitting down and really, really working with them and talking to them about character and the things that really mattered. Um, and, you know, and leaving that up to someone else, you know, in some cases, the babysitters or the preschools or the schools. And and I feel like, um, you know, as you tell your story, I imagine that you spent a lot of time doing those things for families that, um, that, you know, perhaps maybe mom or dad should have been doing. Is that, is that kind of, was that kind of your experience or? Ooh, Brenda, Brenda, how much time do we have girlfriend? Oh yeah. So um, it's funny because the moms would nickname me. They're like, oh, you're, you know, you are literally, you've been a mom 50 times over without actually birthing any children because I was their right hand man. I mean, going back, I even, you know, or reflecting back, excuse me, the breast milk, right? Like organizing breast milk and, and talking to lactation consultants and, you know, picking up the soccer club and Girl Scouts and dropping them off and somebody forgot their cleats and having to go back 30 minutes to get their cleats and their jersey. And so, yeah, I did a, I did everything. I did all of that because when the mom wasn't there, I would step in and help. But I did see that I, I, again, going back to yourself, what do you really want? I saw a lot of parents, unfortunately, especially um, on the East Coast, because there was, um, to to have a nanny, you have to have a certain type of income, right? I saw a lot of parents that were not fulfilled. And I almost felt like they were running away from their kids. I mean, I don't, I don't know how many times I would, you know, take a job right through an agency, and it was supposed to be four hours, you know, maybe, you know, you know, or a couple more hours, maybe 9pm to midnight, and then it would be around three or four in the morning, and I'm texting the parents, like, can you come home? I need to go home. (laughs) I have a life myself. And so I, yeah, I saw a lot of parents, again, if you're not checking in with yourself and you're going through the motions, a lot of unfulfilled parents, because it's hard. I mean, I've been smacked in the face when, with tantrums and I've had crayons thrown at me, like every mom has, right? Like the tantrums on the floor. I mean, the smacking on the face, that should never happen, but that's what happens when mom and dad are not present to, to properly discipline. Wow. And, and so much of that is because we're in this, I mean, I know there's a lot of, there's, you know, the reality is many families, most families have to have two incomes. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. But again, a lot of that has to do with the way we manage our money. I mean, I think, you know, not just, you know, it, it isn't just about that. It actually requires that as much as, 
you know, we, we live this lifestyle of instant gratification Mm -hmm. and, you know, we spend and we borrow and it gets worse and worse and worse. And then, you know, before we know it, there's no time for the kids because we're working all of the time, you know, and that was kind of where I found myself in real estate. Like, wait a minute, I, I came, I, I chose a career in real estate because I wanted to be home with my kids. Right. And then I found that even when I was home, I was all the, always, always on a telephone call. Um, and even now, uh, you know, I still, I still get into that trap. I fall into that trap. These, these phones are so, um, they're so addicting. activating and addicting. I mean, I was looking at something last night and it was so funny because I was completely absorbed in whatever it was I was reading or looking at. And my daughter was sitting a couple feet away from me. <laughs> and apparently she made up this entire song about how neglected she was because her mom was on the phone oh, <laughs> and wow. she was singing it next to me. And I wasn't even aware. And oh, that's wow. somebody who's really, uh, I mean, I, I work on myself all the time to, to not be in that place. I mean, I've let go of those bigger career, those careers, and we've, we've gotten finances in order so that that's not where we're at. We've worked on our marriage. We work on those relationships with the kids. And even then with complete awareness of how that can happen, that's where I was. Right. And, and she's in the kitchen and she's like, ah, oh, you just, you know, total drama, you know, she's 16 and, and that's where she was. And I'm like, well, why did you just, why did you grab me or get my attention? Right. You, you know, and of course she had had my undivided attention all weekend, but um, it was just funny how absorbed we can get in what we're doing in the moment. And um, I think it's probably more so for families that maybe have, you know, somebody like you there to, you know, take care of everything or, you know, you're focused 100% on the kids. Right. And so you're more aware of what's going on for the children right. and, right. and diving. Well, and I'm there. aware, so- and I'm also aware of how unaware the parents are. And that was what was kind of sometimes heartbreaking, you know, because it's like you said, it's one thing if like, you know, she's making a rhyme, like my mom's on the phone and she can't hear me, you know, like that's that's (laughs) one thing. But like, I started to see as my career started to come to a close very quickly that there was, it was, it was almost like a balance of like neglect. And I say that word kind of cautiously, because I think when we think of neglect, we think of like, you know, orphans on the side of the road with no food and no shelter. But you can be neglected in a $3.2 million home. I mean, if the parents are not present and and that's something that me and my friend group have been kind of digesting of what's the balance between, you know, motherhood and feeling fulfilled in your career or having your own objective and your own initiative that you're working on for your personal development, but also being present too, because there's only so much time in the day. And that's what I saw a lot of moms have a struggle with where, you know, if they were young mamas at 19, by the time they were 30, like, what have I done? I've been raising kids and almost like this little mini, mini midlife crisis at 30, trying to be the cool mom and try to be friends. And that's where I'd have to come in and say, you know what? You're not your daughter's friend. I mean, you're friendly, you know, at 31, I can actually say that me and my parents have a great relationship and we are like friends now, but before then they were raising me to be an adult, to be a Christian woman. It, they, they were not allowing me to drink and I wasn't wearing two tops. And again, to each its own, right. To some families, that's not a big deal, but I see that slippery slope where if there's not that discipline and there's not that structure and that authority of like, I'm your parent, I'm not your friend. It, th- the boundaries and the situations that come in the future are, or deplorable and horrible. Absolutely. Um, You brought up some really great topics that I want to talk about, Uh, but let's do that after the break. Let's hear from our sponsor and then we're going to take a short break and let's come back and kind of talk about that parenting friend thing, because I know, um, it, that's a big deal. I, I really see it, especially in 
I think the dance communities that my, my daughter's involved in. So I'd love to talk about going, you know, how do we raise our daughters to, as you know, start with what do they want and really truly honor themselves. And I'd agree with you. It's not by being their friend. So let's continue this conversation after the break and, um, you know, and, and hear more from you. You've got so much wisdom with so many different families and experiences. I just, I, I, I don't think we're ever going to get, be able to get through all of your wisdom in just one episode. (laughs) So um, I'll come back. (laughs) I would love to have you back. Let's take a quick break. Do you love listening to the cheap mama? Well, I'm sure you will love to check out more of the cheap mama because she will be coming to YouTube. You'll be able to watch and view more of the awesome content that you so much enjoy. Simply subscribe into YouTube at Transform You Media Network. That's Transform the Letter U Media Network to catch more Cheat Mama Life. Okay, I am back. Welcome back to the show after that quick break. Uh, just a reminder, I am here with Bree Fallo, who is a brand strategist for Instagram. And just before the break, we were talking about, um, you know, not being friends. And I think this is um, at versus parenting. And this is one that really hits home for me. I've got a 16 year old daughter and, you know, I run into dance moms all the time because she's part of POM. And I remember being at the game the other day and these moms were all talking about the, you know, being best friends with their daughters And all of these moms were also divorced. And I just remember thinking, man, I can't even imagine. And, you know, my daughter definitely, just like everybody, I think media, you know, there's been just after the Grammys, uh, there was, uh, you know, the um, Cardi B uh, dance and I didn't watch it. (laughs) I just saw enough images, you know, to, to see that that's, what we're, what our girls are seeing. And, you know, my daughter walks out for school and I'm like, Hey, wait a minute, you know, let's roll that skirt back down. Cause she's hiked it up a couple inches because, you know, that's what society seems to expect. And we've had these conversations about whether that's, um, whether modesty is important or if it is empowerment and, you know, body confidence, What, um, and you had mentioned that, you know what, we can't be friends. We, we get to parent, that's our role. So, so tell me a little bit more about your perspective on that. Yeah. You know, it's, there's, there's definitely a balance, right? So you don't want your kids to hate you. Obviously you don't want to hate your kids. Obviously that's not the, (laughs) that's not (laughs) the the goal, right? You want to obviously love your children. You probably do. You do. And I, and I even hate to say probably because I just, I've been in some difficult situations where the parent and child relationship was really strained, but I think it's important to realize that you are the authority. And I know that you mentioned that some of the moms on the dance team, um, you know, are divorced. The ones that are saying that, you know, I want to be my, my kid's best friend. And I used to see that a lot too. And it was almost like they were trying to overcompensate for what they had maybe lost in their marriage. And like, we're really getting into it now, right? I'm not throwing any stones and not trying to shame anybody, but you could start to see that, you know, I want to be the cool mom where it's like, no, you know what? But you also don't want your daughter knocked up at 15 or 16, right? Cause things do happen. I mean, I, I can speak from both sides. I, again, I'm not a parent, but I can get how much of a drag it is to have to, like you said, to, you know, put down that skirt, young lady, you know, button up your shirt, or where are you staying? Where are you going? I mean, when I look back at my childhood, my mom was like, you know, inspector gadget. <laughs> like, she, <laughs> you know, if we had cell phones. She would tell us, hey, guess what? I, and this is very, uh, <laughs> this is very common in black and Southern households. Like, hey, I pay the bills. So I will be looking at your text messages whenever I want to. And it, to her and to my father, uh, especially him being a state worker where he would see kids be abducted and and obviously sex trafficking has been huge in Portland and around the world. I mean, they were extra cautious because that's what my dad did for a living. Not to mention my uncle was a police officer in Portland, Oregon, before it was gentrified and, you know, puppy powwow centers everywhere. It was, you know, gang and drugs and shootings. Um, they, they let us know that not everybody is your friend and that we are here to protect you and as christian parents too they felt like 
the way that they raised us, they were going to be accountable to the Lord. So there was even a higher calling on how they were raising us. So to me, the we're, you know, I'm, I'm friends with my daughter. I'm friends with my kid is such a foreign concept because no, I, I never feared my parents, right. When it came to like being scared of them, but I knew when my mom said, no, she meant no. And it usually was for my good. And every time she would tell me no, and I would go against it, things didn't turn out so great. You know, I'd be, I'd be grounded or I put myself in a compromising position, which was, I then had to call her and she had to get me out of. <laughs> so safety and also education wise, you need uh, to raise your kids. <laughs> oh my goodness. Absolutely. I mean, I know that's the cell phone is one of those that my daughter's like, you know, gosh, you know, everybody, nobody else has this. And I'm like, Hey, you know what? She, mine, her phone turns off at a certain time every night. And it turns back like on it. in the morning. I like um, it. You know, she would, when she, we did not let her date until she turned 16. Um, right. Now we weren't, we were also smart enough to be aware that, Hey, if we don't have some latitude, because she has proven to be very trustworthy. And right. I think that's the, every child is different too. You know, right. I, I, you know, I, I remember being a kid and, feeling like, well, this isn't fair. Why do they have different roles than this I have? And why is it? And it really is because every child is, is different. I, I, that's why, you know, a whole nother subject. I don't think discipline quotas in schools and things like that work because discipline's about the heart. It's right. about correcting. It's about how do I correct this child? And what does this particular child need when it comes to correction? You know, so for her, there were things like, okay, well, you know, we, we are going to give you a little bit more latitude. So, you know, we did let, you know, boys um, and her do things under 16, but we were always present or their right. parent was always present. The minute we found out another parent wasn't present, it was like, nope. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And, and you know, again, I want to emphasize that I'm not saying that, you know, your kids, you know, and you don't have a good connection or so or the parent and the child relationship, right, should be one of strain or where you're so, so, so strict that your kids can't do anything. That's a whole other issue as well. Like if you're, I saw some of my parents, um, or excuse me, some of my parents, friends when we were being raised that were so strict you know no sugar gluten-free you know they couldn't sleep over at people's house people couldn't go over to their houses they couldn't do sports I mean that's a recipe that's a recipe for rebellion as well <laughs> you know where you have a whole other issue on your hands because nothing is available and nothing is fun and and everything is bad that there is obviously this resentment sometimes but um the lack of parent guidance um has always been one can, you know, concerning, always been a concern for me. And that was part of the reason why, you know, I had to decide, you know, do I want to have children? Do I not want to have children? Because the kind of parent that I would want to be would take time, would take structure, would be fresh cooked meals, would be dropping off and picking up. And, you know, not to get too off topic, but I always wish that there was um, <laughs> maybe a babysitting class for males and females in high school, or however you identify to to come into a household and see what happens there. I mean, see the tantrums, see the early mornings, if that was even possible. Uh, Cause I learned so much about the day in and day out of parenting. It's a lot of work. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think that's part of the reason with my daughter that she is um, more responsible in some of those areas because she has an eight-year-old brother. So right. she has gotten to help babysit from the time he was born. I mean, I'm sorry, he's six years old. So, you know, so, you know, she was 10 years old when he was born. So she's been, you know, right. an additional caretaker, an additional set of hands for her brothers. So I think, you know, when it comes to boys, that's one area where she is more responsible, but yet, you know, she still is, you know, when it comes to clothing and it comes to the different things she wants to assimilate with what the norm is out there. And that's the hardest thing I think as a parent to fight, because like you said, we can't, we can't be on top of it to the, to the point where there is resentment. Right. Um, and there's gotta be boundaries when she goes out, she knows that we are going to, you know, where are you going? If you decide you're going somewhere different, 
then you need to let us know. And she knows that we're checking that GPS. And if for any reason it is turned off while she's out, then you know what? The next time that answer is no, and that there's going to be consequences when she gets home at night. Um, right. And that's for her safety. Because it, again, like, and that's something that I, I have to say, you know, the agency that I worked with, I worked with several, but one of the first ones was Northwest Nannies in Portland, Oregon, the child and family development part segment of like, what, like cognitively, what can a 16 year old, you know, comprehend and understand when it comes to safety, when it comes to judgment, when it comes to, you know, nutrition, all of those things, right? They are children, they are minors. And that's something that I talk to my parents about all the time is like, let's be honest. I mean, you are an adult at 18, but are you fully developed your brain when it comes to rationalizing situations, right? Again, why parents need to step in the gap and be like, hey, this is, this is why I'm your parent, because I'm older, my brain should be fully developed. <laughs> so I can help you navigate these decisions you're making that potentially could ruin the rest of your life, right? Or maybe not ruin, but set you back in a way that you don't want to be set back. Absolutely. And I think it's more, I think it's even more than that. I think when we really sit down and look at our responsibility, uh, not just, I mean, it starts with the family. What we do right. here is first and foremost. And oftentimes we're out there, um, you know, winning public victories at the expense of our home, at the expense of our wow. marriage, at the expense of our children. And, and the reality is the only way we really, really, truly get to go out and have public victories that matter is when those things in the home are made a priority. You know, when our children are the priority and we teach them up and we lead them in such a way that they become leaders, you know, when we've given them the example of what it takes to keep a marriage together um, right. so that when they leave, that they do the same. That's, I, I believe that's how we really start to make an impact on the world. Because at right. that point we're working on the roots right. We're Absolutely. we're we're attacking the problem at its root, not the symptoms that we see outside in that outside right. world. And, right. um, I think So many of us, so many people are so concerned with the symptoms and how to fix the symptoms. And I think when every every single problem we're faced with and look at throughout the world um, can be stopped at the roots, and that's how we truly leave a legacy. I know that you are short on time today, and I am super excited about having you back because, gosh, we didn't even touch on most of I, I, you know, we didn't touch on the health. We didn't touch on the wealth. We, we spent so much time just, just on, on parenting and there's so much more to talk about. So Bree, how do people get in touch with you? Somebody who maybe wants to, um, you know, utilize your services on Instagram. Maybe there's other podcasters out there that now recognize what a gold mine of wisdom and um, ideas that you are, and they want to get in touch with you. How do they reach you? Yeah, great question. So I am really active on Instagram, of course, um, at Briefalo, spelled B-R-I-E-F-A-L-O-U-G-H. You can follow me over there. That's my interactive website where my phone number is and also my email if people want to inquire and do a free 20-minute consult or they just want to book me for another podcast. I'm always open to chat. Like I said, lots of opinions. (laughs) Awesome. Thank you so much for being here today. And I definitely want to have you back. I believe that there is so much more that we can talk about. And you um, have had a unique, uh, a unique opportunity to look at it from the outside in. Right. And create some different judgments that, you know, and, and not just judge, I hate the word judgment, but but you've different perspectives. You have a unique perspective that you can um, look at it from the outside and teach from the teach from that perspective um, in a way that can help all of us grow in our family lives and our health, our wellness, our our Christian lives. And um, I can't wait to have you back. Thank you so much for coming back. (laughs) Thanks for having me on. You bet. Hope you enjoyed that episode of the Cheap Mama Life Podcast. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review right now if you haven't already. And hit that share button. 
Until next time.